Good evening and welcome. Tonight's presentation is on Promise on Winery from the historic hilltop to the vast valley floor, a postcard history. We're going to start in just a few minutes, but first I'm going to ask you to please turn off your camera and your microphone because we're going to record this event. If you have questions during the presentation, I'm going to ask you to use the chat down below and type in your questions. And then when we're finished, we'll have our pre presenters answer the questions. So thank you. This presentation is sponsored by the Saratoga Historical Foundation. And the mission of the Saratoga Historical Foundation is to preserve the rich history of Saratoga and the community for the education and enjoyment. So if you come to the historic park, you'll enjoy a museum in a 1904 building with information about Saratoga's history. In addition to a permanent exhibit on Saratoga history, we also have special exhibits every four months. A good reason to come back. You'll also see a furnished 1850s pioneer cottage. You're able to come inside a one-room schoolhouse and take your photo or sit in our 1904 interurban passenger stop. You can go up to our website at www.saratogahistory.com for more information about events, as well as seeing the museum. We have a wonderful lecture series in, um, that's coming up, as well as some more events. On July 22nd, we have a Blacksmith Revival Gala held at History San Jose Park, which includes dinner and lots of wine, and lots of history talk. On August 22nd, author Dr. Tracy Bliss will talk about how Californians saved Big Basin Park on Zoom. And Big Basin Park, of course, was our first park in California. We have a new blacksmith exhibit opening in August, September timeframe in the Saratoga Historical Park. So you can always go up to www.saratogahistory.com and while you're up there, be sure to join our email list so you'll get information about all of these exciting events. So just a reminder, uh, about a, four days after this lecture, uh, you can go up and see uh, the recording and uh, on www.saratogahistory.com. Our two wonderful presenters are Gail Unzelman, who is a wine historian and longtime first class postcard collector of California wine history. She has the most extensive collection of California wine postcards in the world. Alice Van Omeren is a wine data researcher and an avid postcard collector and has written several history books. So now here comes Alice with her presentation. Thank you for having us. This presentation is actually uh, based on 40 Paul Masson postcards that uh, Gil Unzelman has found over the last 50 years or so. As Annette was referring to, um, Gil is a very much a longtime postcard collector of uh, California wine history. And so uh, from these and a few from my collection, we're gonna tell tonight's story of a local winery of humble beginnings and uh, that grew really into this giant corporation with worldwide fame. Um, I'm gonna do most of the presentation and uh, Gail has actually done um, the most extensive research on, on Paul Masson and on the postcards that we're gonna be talking about and she'll be available for, for questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So this first uh, uh, chrome postcard, uh, we call them chrome postcard, we call them photochrome. So in the 1940s or so, uh, color photography was uh, introduced to the world and uh, all the postcards became, um, were made with photos. And so postcard collectors call this the the photochrome era postcards, chrome postcards. So we're gonna be using some, uh, some uh, postcard language throughout this presentation. Anyway, so this postcard is of the Paul Masson uh, Champagne Cellars, a uh, very familiar Santa Clara Valley uh, site near Saratoga uh, during the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, we're gonna show quite a few of these chrome postcards. Uh, actually, we'll probably show you most of them. 
and they give a good sense of, of um, this, this winery at this phase uh, of, of time. Um, there are very few early Balmasson postcards. Uh, we've only found uh, three pre-prohibition postcards uh, that were actually issued in 1913. And so we're gonna show you those as well. And then um, on the completion of this uh, 1959 Saratoga winery, um, what the winery did is they uh, published a historical commemorative set of postcards. And uh, they're basically old images that they use uh, for postcards. And uh, so we're gonna talk about the Chrome postcards. We'll talk about the pre-prohibition postcards and then some of these uh, commemorative postcards that you're seeing here. So this is actually the first of uh, the commemorative postcards. Um, it's actually a very young Paul Masson. He was actually born in 1859 on Valentine's Day. And he came to Santa Clara Valley uh, in 1878. He was actually born in, in Burgundy, France. And uh, at the age of 18, he uh, traveled to the United States. Um, he actually comes from a, a, a wine uh, family. So his family, um, had a, he had a family vineyard. Uh, they were pretty much devastated by uh, Phylloxera and uh, he really wanted to make an opportunity um, and come to California. Uh, he found a, a compatriot, Charles Lefranc. He was uh, recognized as a pioneer wine grower of the Santa Clara Valley. And he learned a lot first starting off as a, as a bookkeeper and la later learned how to make, uh, make wine with uh, Charles. He ended up marrying uh, Charles Lefranc's daughter and actually uh, formed a partnership uh, with his son and uh, really started experimenting with making bottle fermented sparkling wine. And um, by 1892, he had really kind of, um, that kind of, you know, was able to basically um, use the champagne, the French champagne method and uh, used to make sparkling wine here uh, in the United States. Um, and really that was kind of his, his uh, claim to fame. Uh, he was able to purchase a vineyard uh, above the hills of Saratoga, and he started planting uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, and uh, he also bought the La Presta Vineyard in 1905 and um, named his hillstop estate as, as, as such, and, uh, and he built his lovely home and his, his mountain winery. Uh, so those kind of were the kind of events that took place during that time. This postcard is um, actually, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful postcard of uh, the Hotel Vendome. Um, just a little bit more about postcards is that uh, the early 1900s was really the kind of the golden age of postcards. Uh, the most beautifully made postcards are from that era. Uh, most of the postcards were actually made in Germany where they had really uh, used uh, lit the lithographs were really uh, more advanced than in the United States. So most of the postcards were actually produced in, uh, in Germany um, uh, before World War I. Uh, and then after World War I, of course, um, we, we stopped um, you know, uh, using German publishers, let's put it that way. And so, uh, but again, this is a good example. It's a, it's a, a beautiful colors, a lot of detail, and um, it's you know guaranteed that this was made um, was made in Germany. So back to why are we showing the Hotel Vendome here? It's uh, was actually opened in 1889. It was uh, 150 rooms, exotic greenhouses, bowling alley, tennis courts. Uh, it was really stated first state of the century art uh, hotel, very luxurious, uh, and had a vintage basement. During the 1890s, Masson was really using for a place to store his, uh, his champagne that he was making. And he actually used the storage cellar of this Hotel Vendome uh, for storing his, uh, his champagne. And so the, the, that's kind of the claim to fame for this Hotel Vendome. During the 1906 earthquake, um, Masson lost over 62,000 bottles uh, in this cellar here. Uh, so, um, he was able to survive the, the earthquake uh, pretty well. He was doing very well in his business at that time and did not take him long to, to really bounce back from them. And it, within, within time, he was able to come back up with you know, half a million bottles of wine uh, ready for marketing. 
Um, historians, when you read about Paul Masson, he really uh, was a very, very astute businessman. So, um, so that's kind of you know part of part of the story here. So the original winery that uh, Paul Masson uh, built uh, before this actually mountain winery that we're seeing here, he actually built it um, in 1905, but in 1906, the earthquake just destroyed that first winery. Um, and so there's no postcards of that, that very, or even no pictures of that very first, uh, very first winery. But he wasn't daunted. He immediately began the construction and he built this, what we're seeing here, this great stone and concrete winery. Um, there are a couple of views of this Palmasan Historic Mountain Winery, and this one is actually from the Commemorate series. Um, it's got a lot of detail postcards. Um, you can see the vineyards in the background. Um, they're using the barrels here. And um, Annette actually noted that there, um, it's meant that there's a, a champagne glass on top of that uh, building. So um, we'd, we'd love to hear uh, some more from local people if, if that's um, if that's the case or so. Uh, so again, a, a very beautiful uh, image of the, the mountain. Um, this is actually um, St. Patrick's Church, uh, which was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. It was on 2nd Street and uh, Fernando. And Palmaston actually re rescued the bricks and the sandstone from this, from this pile and uh, used that to build his, his winery that we saw in the earlier picture. If I go back to it, um, you know, the, the rounded arch that you see there, the, the stone portal, that was actually taken uh, from that church. And it's used now as kind of the front entrance. So, um, so he was into um, to uh, recycling, I guess, uh, at that extent. Um, so again, a postcard of the church of the materials that he took for that. Um, Palmasan continued to find success, success in making champagne. Um, we can call it champagne at the time. Uh, this was before the ban of the word. Champagne. Today we can't call champagne it unless it comes from the French region of Champagne. Uh, but this was still early enough, and so um, this ban uh, didn't actually occur until um, 1914 as part of the, the Treaty of Versailles, actually 1919. Um, and so, um, but prohibition came in the effect, and um, you know, people it's, it just wasn't. Uh, relevant anymore. After prohibition, uh, we stopped using the word uh, champagne. So what we're seeing here is from right to left. Um, we see the vintages. On um, this is a postcard of he. One thing that he was really good at was marketing his his brand and his product, or at least the company was. And so um, so again, you're seeing here postcards of actually his product and uh, 1911 vintage, 1908. Uh, 1914, and then the last one, we, we can't read that. So there's four bottles here uh, that are marked there. The 1908 one is actually extra dry special label. Um, Masson called this, uh, he, he described this wine as, the wine is remarkable for its extreme dryness and effervescence, as well as aroma and delicacy of taste, and is destined to aid greatly to the fame of California vintages. Uh, so very romantically uh, describing his wines. The, uh, the word effervescence, he really liked to use that. And so we see some, some patterns related to that as well. Um, in later years following his death, uh, he discontinued use of vintage dating. Uh, he preferred to use um, the blend of vintage young and old uh, together. So, uh, which is still a practice that's, that's true today. This is a, a postcard of uh, a prize that Paul Masson Winery won. It's the Grand Prize. It was actually uh, in the 1904 St. Louis Exposition, and it was an international jury of wine experts. And uh, Paul Masson Champagne was was given that uh, given that Grand Prize. Uh, he was very proud of this award. Uh, it advertises, you know, the fact that he made a postcard uh, or that it's been used, it, it's been used in several ways. He really liked to show it off, uh, display the diploma. Um, 
you know, it says the pride of California, the best sparkling wine produced in America. So again, using that to, to promote his, his products. Um, the rear caption of this uh, specifically postcard pays tribute to the distinguished French wine experts that were part of this uh, jury. There were six American wine experts on the 28 man uh, jury, um, including some very famous um, winemakers, including California's uh, Henry Lackman from, from Lackman and Jacoby. Um, so again, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, wine tasters and, and wine people uh, were, were part of this, this event. This is actually the first of the uh, 1913 pre-prohibition postcards that, that we're going to show you. Um, uh, by the way, Gail has all three of the 1913 postcards uh, pre-prohibition. Um, we have not; she has not. We have not seen, or she has not seen any other postcards uh, from that early on. So we're thinking it might have been a set set of three. Um, keep in mind that Gail is the you know she has the the largest collection of, of wine postcards. Um, so we're thinking that this might be it. What we're seeing here is the the you know, the, the, basically the, the 28 uh, winemakers that were part of this, this uh, competition, this international jury of the award on wine in 1904. And it's nice because they're all um, photos of them and they're all, their names are all listed there. So for, for historians, postcards can be very, very valuable. Um, they can provide a lot of information. Um, postcards are, I shouldn't say easily accessible, but they're obviously more accessible to the to uh, to to you know to the to the public, uh, and we can talk more about collecting postcards at the end if people have questions about that. But a great a great postcard. This is the second of the um, of the old uh, of pre probation postcards. Um, it's called uh, "Nearly a Million Bottles Undergoing Natural Fermentation." Um, this is the champagne cellar that we're seeing here. Uh, like I said, uh, Palmasan followed a very traditional champagne making uh, method uh, where you basically age uh, the, the champagne or the, the bottle uh, for at least two years. So for to allow for fermentation um, before we, we move it to the, to the riddling racks. Um, and so, um, you can kind of see the way the bottles are laid out that yes, an earthquake would definitely um, uh, cause some damage the way that they're set up. Again, so a great postcard showing the actual, um, the cell, actual sellers. And this is the third one. It's the, uh, the, the riddling process that's actually being displayed on this postcard. Um, the, the French call this process uh, removing the yeast sediment from the bottle um, and we call it riddling. And basically what it is, the bottles are kind of slanted and then one by one, the riddler will quickly take each bottle and then give rotation and shake it up a little bit. And this will uh, create kind of a, a plug of yeast and it slowly goes down into the neck of the bottle. And then at the end it is removed. And so, um, it's kind of a dangerous profession because as you can see here, the, this person is actually wearing um, a steel mesh head mask uh, for this process because oftentimes or sometimes the, the, the bottle will, um, will explode um, before, it's, uh, before, you're not, before we get ready to. Paul Masson himself, he had, uh, his hands were really marked and scarred from, uh, from exploding champagne bottles. Uh, so he was, he was kind of known for, for that. Um, here's a, an, also another commemorative postcard uh, that we talked about, basically using old images in the, in the 1950s to create those. Um, Paul Masson at, at an older age here. Um, he, was a, he was a judge of fine wines himself, and he traveled, uh, he traveled back to France uh, on a regular basis to sample wines. And of course, to share his award-winning California champagne back to where, where he came from. Um, right here, you can see that he's uh, quite happy here. And uh, he's here with um, Paris seller, Monsieur Carmer, who is a champion wine taster of France. 
Um, and so he's a striking a pose here. Um, keep in mind that Palmasan was a striking figure. He was very tall, somewhat robust, very jovial. Um, you know, he loved to um, to wine and dine, um, and so he kind of, he was quite the the large personality. Um, um, it's, it's, it's good to know that, um, you know, even during prohibition, uh, Palmasan did quite well. He was able to remain pretty active in the wine industry. Um, during the dry years, Masan held, uh, he had a government permit to make medicinal champagne and he prospered quite well doing that. He also created uh, a business uh, shipping grapes to winemakers uh, on the East Coast. And um, again, after the repeal of prohibition, um, he, you know, he continued uh, to, to, to make sparkling wine. Although soon after that, he, uh, in 1936, he actually sold his mountain winery to Martin Ray, um, who kind of became a legend of his own uh, on that mountaintop. Um, Paul Masson died in 1940 at the age of 81 and he buried at Oak Hill Memorial Park, also known as the Pioneer Cemetery in San Jose. And then in 1943, the House of Seagram purchased the property um, and intended to use it for a, you know, a, a historic Masonic seek to build a brand into a national and international leader. So uh, Seagram's uh, bought Paul Masson uh, and continued to use the, the label uh, for, some, for some time. So, uh, so there was there's a lot of old uh, Masan and, and new Masan, and so you know, kind of two two different eras uh, after, especially after Masan was gone. Uh, what we're hearing, we're seeing here is kind of it's a, it's a postcard, and it's a it's an overlay of an old French map of California, and um, it's from the 1960s. And you're seeing here is basically on the top is you see the, the old, the original wineries, the mountain winery, the champagne cellar, San Isidero vineyard. So it's a little bit of the old Masson that you're seeing up there in the north. And then um, then in the south, you're starting to see where um, New Pinnacles vineyard and the cellar in Monterey County uh, were, were purchased at that time. In 1955, the Palmason Vineyards uh, was backed up by uh, UC Davis Research, and uh, about 330 acres were bought near Gilroy uh, on Pacheco Pass. And then uh, the Pinnacles Vineyards, that uh, the two that you're seeing there at the bottom, we're talking 5,000 people, uh, 5,000 acres of, of vineyards. Uh, so again, the, the Palmason Company really expanded uh, into the Salinas Valley near Soledad in about 1962. And, uh, you know, and a huge facility, 11 million gallons of wine uh, were, being, were being made by uh, 1968. So with that success uh, came new facilities. And here we again, we have a full front view of the new futuristic ultra-modern Paul Masson Champagne Cellars and Visitor Center uh, that we had in the opening uh, postcard uh, was built in uh, 1959 in Saratoga. It was built by a renowned architect, John Savage Bowles. Um, he also was known for designing San Francisco's Candlestick Park. And this wine facility incorporated the newest technology in every department. It was state of the art. Um, it was, um, so this facility um, was completed and, and the Jew, you know, of course, all the, all the vineyards were able to support this, this production. Uh, blending, bottling, and binning took place uh, here at this winery. Um, and it was the second largest uh, employer in, in Saratoga. So a, a huge, huge production here. The visitor center uh, obviously had its most up-to-date embellishments. Uh, it was very, a very popular um, tourist destination. Uh, people came by the busloads, as you can see in this in this chrome postcard. 
the uh, operation was overseen by um, by Otto Meyer, who was the kind of the a partner, but kind of a president of of this facility, and he was you know in charge of production, and he had worked with Almason since about 1945 or so. Uh, under Meyer, um, 1960, um, Masson became the first American wine grower to establish an export department. And so again, Otto Meyer was very influential as far as you know pushing Paul Masson into the into the next uh, next into the future with uh, with new innovations and new business opportunities. Uh, loads of clever advertising was used at a time, including if you insist on drinking an important wine, try it there. Um, again, a bottle of Paul Masson wine might be sitting in in a Parisian scene. Um, so really uh, using the you know the export and um, the ability to push his brand out uh, into uh, the Euro European markets. And oh, one more thing on um, the the E flag that you see flying here on the flagpole. It took us a little while to figure out what that uh, what that meant. Um, and there's actually um, so back to the exporting. The, the government actually had an honor or an award for uh, excellence expanding exports. And Paul Masson actually earned that award in 1965. So you put the E up there for, for, for excellence. Um, so by the 1960s, Paul Masson was uh, basically America's largest selling premium wine in Europe. So exporting really was a huge success. Um, the other thing that you're seeing on this postcard too is an old wooden Paul Masson press right there in front of the, uh, the display there. So um, the metal sculpture that was in front of the um, the reflecting pool or in the reflecting pool uh, was really kind of towered the the, the winery entrance. Uh, it was called the effervescence of champagne, and really was in honor of Paul Masson, who again used often used this to describe his his dancing bubbles of fine champagne. Um, the sculpture it was it was an award winning artwork. And uh, like I said, it was set in a reflecting pool and it was designed by um, sculptor Gordon Woods. Uh, he was a very talented uh, abstract sculptor and uh, director of the California School of Fine Art Arts at one time. We, uh, Gail and Gail, Gail has been doing a lot of research on this and uh, we really wanted to know what happened to his sculpture, his sculpture if it was um, when the facility was, uh, you know, demolished if, if there was any effort made in, in saving this piece of art. So we'll leave that question up to you. Uh, so maybe at the end we can, maybe somebody can shed some light on it. So all so far, what we've shown you is postcards. And uh, this is the one slide um, where we're not showing you the postcards, although we, we felt like there should have been a postcard. So part of the um, entrance, the rotunda ramp, was in actually a mural. It was a 153-foot mosaic mural that kind of covered that entry hallway. And it was an amazing uh, work of art and that we have had trouble even finding photos or images of it. Um, it was actually done by uh, the renowned Don Jose Moja del Pino. He was a California artist and muralist, and he's uh, seen here in this in this picture. He was a one-time painter of the court of Spain, and he really was, uh, you know, tasked with telling the story of wine. And he did that. He did that from started from biblical times, and uh, well, all the way up to the the ramp, and um, and of course uh, on the left here on the small you see Paul Masson in front of his mountain winery prattling a, a bottle of champagne. So of course, Paul Masson was part of the, the story of wine. So he had um, his own uh, mural in there. Um, so uh, again, uh, just uh, we had a lot of questions and about the, the mural. So hopefully uh, we're hoping somebody can, can help us out on any more information on this in this beautiful piece of artwork. So, the visitor center was really cleverly constructed. Uh, here you're seeing a spacious 10 foot catwalk 
uh, which really allows people to tour the facility. Uh, you perfect view of into the wine cellar where there's blending and bottling and packaging and warehousing um, and aging of, um, of wine here. Keep in mind that no wine was crushed, at, uh, no grapes were crushed at this facility. So the crushing took place somewhere else, but the blending and the storing, et cetera, took place at this facility. Uh, this facility. Huge, um, we're talking 9 million cases of wine on an annual basis, were, which means 260 million gallons of wine that were being um, you know, uh, produced or stored at this facility. Or, um, uh, this photograph here gives you a good look of um, visitors that are looking over about 300 or about 200 redwood and oak bats in an aging cellar. And this photo, it's a postcard, but um, as with all uh, postcards, they come from pictures. And so there's always a photographer behind the uh, postcard. And this photographer was Ansel Adams. So um, one of America's most famous photographers. Ansel Adams, who lived in San Francisco, um, and but did a lot of work, uh, commercial work, and one of them was uh, doing doing photos for for wineries. Um, so the in nineteen in nineteen fifty nine, this was considered um, you know one of the most uh, you know inspiring wineries uh, in the United States. And so they actually had a uh, photo exhibition, uh, which was based on Adams and his partner's work. And so um, one of the books, and we'll talk about that at the end, Gift of Grape was actually illustrated by uh, Ansel Adams. And, and so a lot of photos from the Palmason Winery can be found in that book, uh, both new and old ones. So again, call it a, you know, color postcards. Uh, there are three postcards that are credited to Ansel Adams, um, which, is, which is kind of, you know, kind of um, here's a here's another one that you're seeing. Uh, of course, blending and storage provided ample uh, for tasting. So tasting uh, samples were part of the experience at this facility. So visitors to uh, the Palmason Winery, of course, uh, were also introduced to the tasting hall uh, to sample the wines. And sometimes there was many as uh, 16 or 17 different wines, including sparkling, of course. And uh, in, this, in this postcard, we can kind of see the long sample running along the, the bar and all the samples running along the left of this postcard. And then we also notice um, the, the tables and the chairs in this postcard as well. And there are just not any tables and chairs. These chairs were actually first released in 1952 and they were designed by a renowned Italian uh, American artist by the name of Harry Bertoia. And he was a very important figure in American modernism and uh, really ahead of his time as far as uh, metalwork. And he was, he made these uh, polished seal mid-century modern mesh chairs. And um, if you look at those chairs, they're mainly made of air, like sculptures. Um, the space really passes through them. And today these chairs are quite, so the message really here that they were using you know, most state of the art, um, most uh, highly sought after um, pieces to attract um, people to the winery. Um, another postcard is again advertising. Um, you could see that behind the bar there were these uh, lighted cabinets that displayed some of the awards. Again, Paul Masson was very good at uh, showing off what the award winning bottles and the ribbons associated with that. And this postcard is um, kind of unique in a sense. It includes the rare cream sherry bottle that you see here. The heart shaped bottle uh, was really made to honor um, Paul Masson's birthday, which was on Valentine's Day. So they made this bottle um, to ship to kind of commemorate his birthday, and it's in the heart shape. From the opening day in 1959, um, you know, they've continued to, to win awards. Um, and um, 
you know, in the in the early 1980s, the production slowly starting being moved from Santa Clara to the more Salinas Valley. And uh, in 1987, Seagram sold the Masson brand. And we talked about that. In 1990, this remarkable build building uh, facility here was demolished and uh, housing development and the Greenway have taken, taken place, have taken that over. So in the hills above Saratoga, Paul Masson's original mountain winery uh, is actually now a historical landmark and it just celebrated its uh, you know, summer, 65th summer concert series. So, um, so in some sense, you know, part of the, the wineries, some of the structures still, uh, still have been preserved. And, um, and remember this, and by the way, this is also an Ansel, Ansel Adams uh, postcard. And on this postcard on the back of it, there's actually the old adage printed on the back, uh, good wine makes good friends. And again, something Paul Masson used a lot, um, these quotes during the, the winemaking. And um, this is the last slide that we just added. Uh, so two books that have been written on Paul Masson, The Gift of Grape, I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so the Ansel Adams uh, images are in that book. And then uh, the, the, Uncommon, the Uncommon Heritage is a little bit more, shows a little bit more of the marketing um, that Paul Masson uh, as a winery used. So these have been uh, two sources that, that's, um, and those are kind of the only ones that uh, we used or we were able to find. So, um, so those are kind of, um, open it up to questions or um, maybe, uh, should I stop sharing? Great, would you like me to um, read some of the questions that we have? Okay. Uh, well, one person asked, uh, what happened to the mural, which we're all asking. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Alice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we don't know. Um, again, uh, we, you know, we've, we've had a net on it. Uh, so unless somebody else can, can share it, I don't know if anything was actually saved from uh, that demolishment in, 19, uh, in 1990. Um, I just can't imagine. I mean, this is not the 1950s or, or 90s, so things should have been preserved. So I don't know the answer. I know. Um, another question is, where was the Hotel Vendome located? Ooh, good question. Close to downtown San Jose, wherever that was, I think it was. It was downtown, but I'm seeing on what street. Uh, I might not have that. Uh, nope. Unless um, somebody can chime in. Yeah, so somebody wrote uh, in response a, a uh, split image postcard on the bottom, an exterior view of the Hotel Vendome sitting on landscape grounds on the upper right, an interior view of the hotel lobby on the upper left, an interior view of the hotel parlor. The hotel's public rooms were luxuriously furnished and carpeted the hotel was built in 1889 on the 11-acre estate of Joshua Belden, an early mayor of San Jose. At the time, it was the most luxurious hotel in San Jose. The hotel was demolished in 1990 and replaced by houses. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say what, what corner was. No. Um, okay. Someone asked... Uh, and I think you you covered it in uh, your presentation, but where was the um, Champagne Cellars located on, on Saratoga Avenue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and you're, you're correct, it's now housing development and really the only remains are the street names. Oh, really? Okay. That, that are named after uh, wine. Um, Another question about the mural. I think we should just make up something and then it'll become true. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody suggested there's some other books. Um, Modern Eden by Charles, Charles Sullivan, uh, Vineyards in the Sky by um, Martin Ray's wife are two good stuff, two good books on, on the topic. Um, uh, someone said uh, Vendone on Bassett. So I don't know if that's a street in San Jose. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, Somebody asked about, um, and Gail, maybe you can answer this question is about, you know, how you go about collecting uh, postcards or wine postcards in particular. And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about postcards in general. Um, you know, we, we go to postcard shows, so, and there used to be a lot more of them where we just go and buy postcards, um, you know, where postcard dealers are. Um, and we also buy online, of course, eBay. Um, and then, you know, there's the traditional garage sales or, um, you know, antique shops. But it's always hard if you are collecting postcards on a specific topic. Um, and that's where eBay comes in really handy because you can just put in the, the search term, right? So I collect, I live in Petaluma, I collect Petaluma postcards. You know, when I type in Petaluma, I get all Petaluma. But Gail, I want to ask Gail a little bit about wine postcards because that's a little bit harder. And so, what what has been um, your strategy, Gail, as far as collecting post winery postcards? And I Carl think, Cal, yeah. I think at the at the beginning of a collection, typing in winery or wine, California wine winery, is a good start. Or vineyard, those catch names. But as you get more and more postcards, you have to be more specific. And sometimes you just want to search Paul Masson and that that works. But and if you know the history really well, a lot of times you can find a postcard that's actually of a wine scene that the seller doesn't know it's a vineyard and I've mentioned before that Colfax up in the gold country is, um, it was a major wine center in, in the, during the gold rush, but nobody ever sells a Colfax postcard as a wine card. But I type it in because every now and again in the background, you see a vineyard and that's a wine card. And then there's the story of how the wineries around there brought all of their grapes to the Colfax train station and blah, blah, blah. But um, mainly anymore, I'm pretty left with just eBay. Um, it used to be postcard shows. And, um, and how did you get started, Gail? When did you start? How did you get about? I got started because my husband and I learned about wine, and I think I'm a collector. Period. You know, wine mm. books, postcards, um, and I'm a historian, and I couldn't help that. And um, mainly, it's it's for the historical preservation of of the wine industry. I think, and. That was back in the 60s. So I've been collecting a long time. And I'll tell you one thing, postcards were a lot easier to find back then of early ones. You can find the, the chromes nowadays, but you don't find the early cards that I found 30, 40, 50 years ago. So I don't know where they are. Maybe they're not. Right. And remember, Gail, um, Gail had, at one time had the largest collection of uh, wine books in the world. And so that was kind of her main uh, collector, new collection. Um, but then you started doing postcards and then you even said at one point, you you just call wineries and ask them to send up what their letterhead or something. Or to... <laughs> I thought I should collect letterheads at one point. So I sent letters out to all the wineries in California so that they would answer me on their letterhead. and. That was kind of silly, but it 
I, 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 I had a big file of them and actually most of my archives have been sent to UC Davis and they hauled it away with great glee. So I guess it wasn't so silly. Oh. How, how can you tell if it's an authentic uh, postcard? I am not an expert in that at all, but nowadays, if it's a photo reprint, usually the the eBay sellers say it's a photo reprint or a reprint. And after a while, if somebody is giving you a very shiny, uh, smooth postcard that was issued in 1910, well, you know that's not true. <laughs> So a lot of times, like if you buy on eBay, they, you know, they, they have the front of the image and then the back of the, you know, and a lot of times you can see if it's, you can see if it's a postcard. Um, yeah. It's not a huge margin to put out, you know, I don't know. I guess some of the more expensive postcards, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, someone had a question about, um, can you tell us about Charlie Chaplin and Paul Masson? And I, I think it's a clean story, but. I can't. Can you? Do you know it? There was always a rumor that um, there was a, uh, a special, uh, I don't want to say bottle or, or glass, uh, just for Charlie Chaplin when he visited uh, Paul Masson. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't either. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I did read something that he entertained quite a bit and had many famous people come over, including Charlie Chaplin, I heard, but I didn't hear anything beyond that. Well, well Charlie Chaplin was, um, uh, had a um, film company in Fremont, so, oh, you know, it, did. Hmm. It, it's highly likable or, you know, if you like to drink, that would be a, a good partner, would be Paul Masson. Yeah. Well, Paul Masson liked the celebrities and he liked to entertain and he liked to have anybody over. So I would imagine they could have been good buddies. Yeah. Um, there was a, a question about, um, let me see here. Oh, somebody had a question about Azul Springs on Mount Eden Road in Saratoga. Have you run across anything about that? I think that was just bottled water. It wasn't a... Uh... What was that? Azul Springs in Saratoga on Mount Eden Road. Yeah, unless it's, um, unless it has to do with wine, you'll probably didn't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> that narrows it down. Uh, we only do wine. We don't do water. Yeah. So I also mentioned um, cardcow.com. It's, you know, it's a vendor. A lot, some postcard dealers have their own websites. So sometimes we get. Did you want me to tell the story about Anna Held or not? Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah I like that one. <laughs> well, there is a story that Anna Held took a, well, she was an actress, right? Or a dancer, dancer. Yeah. She took a champagne bath up at Paul Masson's La Cresta mansion up by the winery. And I think it's come down now that she did not ever get in a bathtub, especially naked. And what happened was Paul Masson sprayed champagne on her. So she had a foamy bath and it was not too risque, I guess. Yeah. And that's supposed to be the true story. Okay. <laughs> People are given some great resources as far as other, um, you know, other book, other, other wine books. So. Go yeah, well, Charles Sullivan, you know, is California's best wine expert, and I would recommend any of his books and his. His um, his Eden book is has has a lot on Palmasan, but 
um, mostly it's, it's, it's not, if you're looking for personal information, it's not personal, it's wine and business related. It's a good book. Yeah. It is. We had him give a presentation to our uh, membership many years ago. And he Charles was just, did? Yeah, he was just great. Yeah, he knows everything. He yeah. did. He passed away, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, somebody added that the um, champagne sellers always had unlimited wine tasting, which I think is why it was so popular in, in uh, Saratoga. Oh, is that right? I read that people like to entertain out of town guests by just taking them there for the afternoon. So maybe that was the. Uh, it was a popular venue, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And during the, you know, 60s, there, there was no charge for wine tasting. True. As yeah. the world has said, yes. So. And well, they know, had, if they had 17 bottles out, for you to sample that was a lot so Gail, a lot is there um so you are there other wineries where there are a lot of postcards of it i mean one of the reason why we did all the sun winery is because there were so many right so there was like you know 40 to 40 cards or, or yeah well that seems like nothing compared to italian swiss colony mm -hmm. I mean, they were the granddaddy i I've, I've got 200 postcards from Italian Swiss colony and and then in Napa Valley was um, Christian Brothers or it was called Greystone to begin with started in 1900 and many 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 and I, I always like it the most when they have messages on the back like somebody actually got that postcard and sent it to somebody and and especially if there's a message about their day or their visiting. And there was one that says from um, Christian Brothers, <laughs> they sent a postcard home and said, we had a, a wonderful gray, li gray Line tour today at Christian Brothers in Sonoma County. And being a Sonoma County person that... I thought, oh, wow, well, they got that one all mixed up. But, um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the great thing about postcards is, you know, you have the image on front, um, you know, and there a lot of times there's, you know, there's so much to talk about on some of those cards. And then you have the back where people, um, for genealogists, of course, there's, you know, there's the name and the address. And so, um, and and then, of course, uh, whatever is written on the postcard also. And so yeah. they're little treasure troves, these little Yeah, postcards. they really get to be special when you can connect the message on the back to the front of the postcard or of the family of like Behringer Brothers or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so here, here's another question. Um, it says, can you tell us more about Ansel Adams' story of a winery? And in, did they use those photos for postcards? Me? You? Uh, go ahead, Gil. Um, there are, I think I counted them, in Gift of the Grape, there's like 30-some Ansel Adams photographs. And as far as I know, there are only three postcards, maybe four. I forget right now. Um, so it's too bad that they didn't use more of his photographs and change them into postcards there because they're brilliant, just brilliant. Especially of the vineyard. There's really no postcard of Palmason's vineyard, except the background of the original winery. I'm looking for more questions. <laughs> An Annette? Yes. Er earlier, somebody asked if there's anything left from Palmason champagne cellars. Yes. This is the stone of, of and Jack put the cork from one of the champagne bottles on it to celebrate the last pop. 
and I have a bucket full, five gallon bucket full of these rocks and I have them lining a flower bed at the side of my house now. That's where the only the, thing I know of that's left. Where were the bottom. rocks? Where were those stones? Well, I don't know. See how they are. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. It looks like. And so, and then it's rough on all the other sides. I don't know if this was part of the front of Palmasan. They had the very beautiful rocks in the front of Palmasan. I, I don't know where it was from. Did, it, did, just, did you just pick it up in the rubble? Yes, I think that's what my husband did. Oh, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> I have one theory about where the artwork went, but I have no way to check it out. Seagram's was headquartered in Ontario, Canada, and they had a big art museum there of their own. And I feel that if they were that interested to have put all of that artwork into the Saratoga facility, maybe they took them back to Ontario to decorate their big wine business back there. But I don't know. I, I can't believe they just demolished it all and smooshed it. But you have a piece. <laughs> I don't see any more questions. There's some questions, there's some comments about where uh, uh, the Champagne Center was located, which I think we established. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there are some good resources. Yeah. Um, one person mentioned that R.B. Garrett uh, who has a book on Saratoga uh, might have included some rec recollections about Palmasan because he would have been a neighbor uh, in his book. Uh, so we could check that. Have you thoroughly gone through the local newspapers? Is there a Sar Saratoga paper or is that would be San Jose Mercury? Um, we have a Saratoga uh, community paper that doesn't really cover much um but anymore. maybe the san jose mercury would somebody had to really cover the demolishing of that old saratoga paper news would have would have covered it very likely the yeah. more recent ones of the past 10 years or so haven't well i think that should be checked out yeah. is that for you annette <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yeah Somebody asked if, if they have old uh, Palmasan postcards, what to do with them. And we get that question a lot as, as postcard collectors. You know, we all, you probably all have a stash somewhere, either from your parents or your grandparents or something. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Palmasan chrome postcards that we've been showing you, the, the colored ones, are quite common. And so uh, you can just get on eBay and do Paul and the Sun and you'll see a lot of those. And, and so they're not worth a lot. And so, um, so there's no, you know, intrinsic value to it. Of course, those 1913 ones there are, um, and even those, those commemorative ones, they're, they're all quite common. Um, and so they're, so they're not worth a lot. So the question I always get, what do you do with, with postcards in general? And uh, we as postcards collectors like to keep them in circulation. Um, so uh, we try to prevent them from throwing them in the garbage. So, um, you know, donating them to a postcard club or, um, you or know, a museum. Or to a museum. Or a museum, or, yes. Yeah, a museum in the first place, of course. Um, or, um, you know, antique shops still, you know, I mean, it's hard because you know, they won't pay a lot for, for even a box of postcards, especially if they're not categorized. So postcard collectors like it when they can go straight to, you know, Sonoma County and, and look at all the postcards within Sonoma County. Um, 
but you know, donating them or just we, you know, anything to any any suggestions, Gail. Um, just you're probably not around. The, I I never had that problem, so never, I, <laughs> yeah. Us postcard collectors, we we keep them all, of course. Um, you know, but it's it's you know, and and also what to do with the collection. So, you know, I lived in Stockton for over thirty years, and. I amassed uh, two to 3,000 postcards of, of that town. Um, I left Stockton and uh, lived in Sonoma County. I actually donated all my postcards to the University of Pacific. And so all my Stockton postcards are now online. So as collectors, those are kind of nice projects, you know. Uh, you know, at some point, Gail will, you know, her winery postcard collection will go somewhere. So. If you have a great collection, then there there are definitely opportunities to just keep those share of it. But I think whatever collection you have, you have to make a list of them or catalog them. You can't just stick them in a drawer. If you don't know what's there, then you're never going to be able to proceed, I think. Yeah. Um, how, how do you archive them? Do you have special uh, plastic sleeves or? Uh, I use plastic sleeves and then I use pages in three ring binders. I know Alice said that she uses a postcard box to put hers in. Um, but they should be protected with a plastic sleeve, definitely. Yeah, you can buy, buy those little uh, those plastic sleeves, perfectly made for for postcards. So there's soft sleeves, and then there's also you know more robust ones. And uh, Gail puts hers in 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 albums, and I put them in boxes. So we have slightly different strategy. Um, <laughs> as long as you can find what you're looking for. Exactly. Now, I do want to say that Gail is very, she has been, you know, her collection is, she's been uh, taking notes and annotating it, and it's all very, every postcard has a description and a date, and um, so, yes, um, and mine not so much. <laughs> Gail, do you collect any other postcards besides mine? No. I'm very proud to say no. So that's the hard part for. Yep, that's the very hard part is not to. Oh, actually, I, I did collect, I think there's about 10 Unselman Motel that was in Santa Rosa. So that's the family motel. But that won't count, right? No. <laughs> and then uh, tell them the story about the Red Riding Hood postcard. Um, that's still wine, so it's okay. Right. Yes. I, I decided one day in reading Little Red Riding Hood that she went to visit her granny with a bottle of wine in her basket with the cakes and, and I was not finding anything to collect on wine postcards. So I said, this is a wine postcard. And so I have made a nice little collection of Red Riding Hood, but she has to be carrying her basket with the bottle of wine. The wine has to show. And that's my little Red Riding Hood story. It's good you have standards like that. <laughs> yes, I, we do have standards, don't we? Yes. <laughs> yes, extensive notes are extremely helpful. So yes, um, so Gil is, Collector extraordinaire. Well, I believe in finding what you're looking for. That's like having a thousand books and, and not having them cataloged. And you don't know if you have it, if you still want it, right? Yeah. Well, are there any more questions? I'm looking. This was just really a fabulous presentation by both of you. It was just Thank wonderful. You. Lots totally of memories. Fun. Yeah. Lots totally of memories of, of Palmasan and Saratoga. And I think uh, 
Everyone that, that's here has enjoyed your presentation immensely. Good. Can we save the chat notes? There's been so many helpful comments that um, I don't know. I'll she try. Put in her mouth. Yeah, yeah, I should be able to provide those in that. Can you do that? Good. Thank you. Okay, without, uh, well, I want to thank you very much. I invite everybody to come back on August 22nd when we we have uh, Tracy Bliss talk about uh, the park and um, and we have other uh, items too that I'm sure you'd be interested in. So go up to www.saratogahistory.com and in a couple of days you'll see this uh, presentation, um, the recorded version of it on our website and you can click on it and listen to it again. So thank you very much, both of you. Thanks, Thanks for all you do.